inviting me today. It's quite an honor to be on here with the distinguished panel and Admiral Allen. No pressure for me, anyway. <laughs> uh, the issues that are important to the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, is no different than what, what's important to the IMO and the operators in this room today. Cybersecurity, utilization of ballast water systems, the sulfur cap, uh, port access routing into our ports, and seafarer access in the U.S. ports. So I wanted to cover a couple, couple topics. Not all are environmental, so you can take a breather while I talk about that. Uh, I'm going to start with some good news. Uh, the Coast Guard released a final rule on seafarer access to maritime facilities in April. And this rule helps to correct a problem caused by our domestic uh, regulations, the Maritime Transportation Safety Act, where some maritime port facilities unnecessarily restricted seafarers to the ship without an easy way to get to shore. And our final rule requires that all, all of the MITSA regulated port facilities provide those seafarers holding a, US, a, a valid U.S. visa or other covered individuals like chaplains or people uh, dealing with seafarers, the mariners, the ability to transit from the gate to the ship or from the ship to the gate. Uh, and it's, it's supposed to be done in a timely fashion and at no cost to the seafarer. The facility required uh, to document the access procedures in their uh, facility security plan, and for the most part, most facilities didn't need this rule uh, to provide access to seafarers, but there were a few in the U.S. Um, that required this, this rule. So if you have a ship that's operating in the U.S. and you experience these problems, um, now with the final rule, we can, we can actually enforce it. Uh, I would just ask that your, your captains or your vessel agents relay that information to the Coast Guard if there are any problems of the seafarers getting to the gate, getting off the ship. Uh, something that also might be of interest to this audience is that the U.S. Coast Guard has initiative to conduct a port access route study for multiple ports along the Atlantic coast. We're calling this the ACPARS, the Atlantic Coast uh, Port Access Route Study. So we love our acronyms in the U.S. Uh, we announced this via Federal Register in March. And uh, like any rulemaking or any kind of study that we do, we get a lot of input uh, from the maritime industry. The Coast Guard is required to periodically study potential traffic density and to assess the need for safe access routes. And we've done this on a port by port study in the past. So we've just done small ports. Uh, this is the first time that we're doing it collectively uh, throughout the whole Atlantic coast. And we cannot complete this without the coordination and input from the maritime community. We'll also be coordinating with other government agencies like the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, who lease out the outer continental shelf for drilling, but also for offshore wind energy leases. We want to make sure that the port access routes are not impeded by the creation of these of many, uh, I think there's 15 wind farm leases that are existing right now on the East Coast, and we want to make sure that there's not an interference with our, our established shipping lanes. So the next couple of topics I wanted to just touch upon before we get to the question and answer session is they're a little bit more complicated and challenging issues for not only the Coast Guard, but the world. Obviously, the sulfur cap 2020 deadline is upon us. And we're about six months out, and the only thing we're certain about is that we anticipate some growing pains. But like any other new requirement, we will get there. I mean, we've experienced these things before, really water separators, all the bar pole rigs, and so on. Things are progressing in IMO and the development of the guidelines to facilitate implementation. And the U.S. is solid, solidly behind and involved in the development of those guidelines being developed at IMO. And despite some rumors, the U.S. is not proposing to slow down or delay the requirement. We want a smooth and transparent implementation. Now we've heard many concerns, you know, with visitors to the Coast Guard headquarters, um, that there may not be ample fuel or safe fuel available um, on time. And to that end, if the ship is found non-compliant because of non-availability, the U.S. will factor that in to our, our enforcement formula. 
And I, I think that most people would agree that the Coast Guard tends to be fair and understanding if you can justify it. Another concern that really surprised me, and maybe it was really a request, but when we've had visitors at Coast Guard headquarters, um, was mainly from the responsible, responsible operators that intend to comply fully with the uh, sulfur cap. And the, one of the requests that they had is that they want the Coast Guard to um, really enforce and take a strong enforcement posture on the, on the sulfur cap. You know, so this, this I understand, is um, a way to make sure that there's a level playing field. So if the responsible operator is using the cleaner, more expensive fuel, then all shippers should. But the question is, is how do you enforce that offshore, beyond the territorial waters? So as you know, we already have the emission control areas around North America, and uh, that it already requires the use of cleaner fuel. Since 2015, we've been using the 0.10%. And through port state control exams, we have been able to, to uh, check fuel receipts and logs to verify compliance. We also initiated a voluntary fuel sampling program in 2016 that helps give us a, a sense of the overall compliance. And what we learned was that vessels were complying, and we also learned that fuel sampling is very expensive, and probably not, not something that we can sustain over the long term to sample every ship that comes into port. But we can sample. And I won't rule out the affordable technology will be available soon that could one day take air samples far offshore to verify compliance. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we sent some Coast Guard uh, representation out to California Maritime who was testing their drones that would do just this. They would go out and sample the air quality and report it back via satellite, uh, the results. So that could be taken downwind of the, a stack of a ship. Now, it's not on the market yet, but it's definitely something that's being researched and developed. And I, I anticipate there's a demand for that. So you might see that in the near future. And that end, we could probably be using that for the Coast Guard's enforcement as well. In the end, for the 2020 cap to be effective, we have to know when there's a problem. So if there's countries that are not providing the compliant, safe fuel, um, we need to know. The International Maritime Organization needs to know. Everyone needs to know so we can put more pressure on those countries to fulfill their obligations. <laughs> this is something that we want. And like any other MARPOL violation, whether it be palace water or spilling oil into the water, we do see this as a, a pollution that we can we can go after companies for. Obviously, we'll take it consideration all the factors, but if we feel that there's deliberate attempt to avoid compliance with the regulation, that gets into the criminal realm or a civil penalty realm. And that's not something where we want to go. We want the operators to be compliant on their own. But we can use it if we have to. Now to one of my other favorite subjects is balanced water management. I'm sure there's a couple of fans out there. I think I was talking to them earlier today. Um, there's really not much new to report from the Coast Guard's point of view. The Coast Guard's Marine Safety Center just approved the 19th ballast water system last week. And there's a, six more that are being reviewed, should be approved, hopefully, in the short term. And that's a good sign that we're progressing with available technology. The requests for extensions for installing the ballast water systems are still being issued, but they're only being issued on a case-by-case -case basis. With legitimate, if you have legitimate engineering plans and contracts that show that you're planning to install these systems on board your ships, but you can't install it by the deadline, that's something that we would consider as a valid request for extension. We wouldn't entertain the fact that you just don't want to put it on or maybe the ship's going out of business. You know, that, that's not a reason. If that's the reason you're going to use, I would just recommend that you don't bring that ship to the United States. And again, we see ballast water discharge like any other pollution discharge, something that we can take operational control on and enforcement actions on. So during our port state control exams, 
the typical deficiencies that we've seen uh, related to ballast water is that the systems are inoperable. And we've heard many stories from uh, ship, ship companies saying, hey, the, the equipment just does not work. Um, we have found, though, that companies really aren't maintaining their equipment. They're not maintaining their equipment. They're not using their equipment unless they're in U.S. waters, and therefore they don't have to use the equipment effectively. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed, but it's got to be addressed on the other end. All of the cases that we have for ballast water management, obviously we, we discover these things through our port state control process. And they're handled at the lowest level, meaning at the individual ports, they have captain of the ports that can make decisions on whether or not your ship can operate in their port. And in those cases where the Coast Guard has imposed operational controls, we have had vessels uh, required to modify their cargo loading plan um, to facilitate the safe and compliant ballast water discharges offshore, meaning in some cases we ordered the ship to go out 200 miles, discharge a little bit of that ballast, then you can come in, do a little bit more cargo, then you can go back out and discharge a little bit more, and then you can come back in. So you get my drift here, it's not very economically feasible to do that. Um, it's not something that we like to do, but again, we have the requirements, we have very strict requirements for ballast water in the U.S., and we're enforcing them. Um, the other thing I would just encourage you to do is just make sure that your crews are, are familiar with the systems. That's another thing that we're seeing is over-reliance on uh, the warranties from the manufacturers and the crews not understanding how to use the equipment or maybe even how to do minor repairs. I'm not sure if that invalidates warranties, but it is something that you need to do because machines do break and uh, the, the engineers and maybe even the deck officers need to be familiar with this information, this, this equipment. With all that said about ballast water, I do want to mention that there was recent legislation called the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act, or another acronym, VITA, is what we're calling it. It passed in December, and this will complicate an already complicated issue on ballast water and all other vessel discharges. To make a long story short, VITA requires the Environmental Protection Agency to develop the environmental discharge standards, but it also requires the Coast Guard to develop regulations to enforce it. So you're going to have this two-pronged government approach. Um, we hope that it will help eliminate problems from state to state having different standards, but the Coast Guard just adopted via these, this new act, um, all the incidental discharges related to vessels, um, including gray water, uh, cathodic uh, protection, and so on that might be released from a ship. So that's not something that we wanted to be in the business of, we are now in the business of. Uh, because it requires rulemakings, both EPA and the Coast Guard has to develop new regulations on this, uh, we won't have an overnight solution. So what I would just say is that nothing's changing overnight. I would just keep your eyes on the news because we'll continue to uh, announce things as we can publicly on any kind of rules or policies that we have. All right, so the last complicated issue I just want to just bring up, and I know what we talked about uh, during these next two days, is cybersecurity in the maritime domain. AP Moeller showed us that no company, big or small, is immune to this. And just a few months ago, when a vessel was arriving into a U.S. port, they received an email that appeared like it was a legitimate port state authority asking for sensitive vessel documentation information that would normally be requested when, before the ship arrives, the notice of arrival process. But it wasn't from the Coast Guard, so we know it wasn't from the legitimate Port State Patrol Authority, but the email address kind of looked like it was. It, it, I think it said, I think the email address was Port State Patrol regime at PSC dot whatever. It wasn't even a dot gov. It was something, uh, some, something made up. We don't know who 
um, was behind it, but we do know it was a fishing attempt. And thankfully, that master of that ship reported it because it, it just didn't seem right to him. He was already doing a notice of arrival. Why is the Coast Guard asking for this additional information through this system? Um, so he was that vessel did not fall prey to that fishing scam. And in another situation that just happened a couple, maybe a couple months ago, a ship was transiting through the locks of a canal, and um, one of the mariners on board reported irregularities with their, their personal cell phone. Uh, they had a banking app on their personal cell phone. And it was, it was likely that the, the ship was close enough to shore that the mariner's smartphone was hacked in some way, resulting in some loss of money from this person's personal account. Uh, we learned about it was a U.S. citizen. Um, and we learned about it, and there's a lot of debate about, well, is that, is that our problem? Is it the company's problem that somebody's cell phone was hacked while they were on board the ship? And I think on first, the first feeling is like, ah, I, don't think that's my, I don't think that's our problem. That's his problem, right? But if that same mariner was on a ship and his wallet was stolen out of his cabin, would that be a problem for the company? And I would, I would venture to say that you would say yes, because maybe that's a security violation of getting physically onto the ship or someone going into areas or shipped areas that they should not be. So then when you compare those two situations, I say, what's, what's really different? It's still a violation of security, which is a different method of getting on board. They weren't physically on board, but they were on board. So I just illustrate those two different examples, I mean, from the crewman to the ship itself, um, how vast this problem is. And if you're not losing sleep at night because of cybersecurity, you really should be losing sleep at night. Um, mar maritime transportation systems facing increasing risk due to cybersecurity vulnerabilities. We're becoming more and more dependent on computers and technology for everything, for navigation, for communication, for engineering, for safety, for cargo handling, and so much more. We don't have prescriptive requirements for cybersecurity. And I don't know if you want us to be prescribing prescriptive requirements for cybersecurity. But we do have the authorities to mandate companies to, to address the cyber risks at their facilities or on their vessels. And for addressing the shipboard cybersecurities or the vulnerabilities, uh, IMO Resolution MSC 42898 requires cyber risk must be addressed in accordance with their International Safety Management Code. And what this means is, is that companies should be developing cyber risk management plans as part of their safety management system. The Coast Guard is now developing how to apply that resolution for our, our U.S. Port State Control Exam program. But the best advice I can give you without giving you, you know, exactly how to do it is just review the best practices already available to the industry and implement changes. And make sure your crew members are trained and aware of these things. It starts with them. The other thing is, is that you might want to hire a third party that is very well trained in cybersecurity. Now, I wouldn't say that as a mariner, I really understand all this cybersecurity business. And I'm not sure if I'm going to get there in time to help, you know, develop regulations or policies, that sort of thing. But as the ship owner or operator, I think that you could probably hire a third party to help you in that endeavor to protect your, your, um, your business. And the other thing that I would ask that is if you're coming to a U.S. port and experience some type of cyber incident, you should report it. You should either report it to your own flag administration or to the U.S. Coast Guard. And we talked, I think you had mentioned something, Admiral, about transparency. Uh, we really need to share what problems are out there so we can fix them in the future so we don't repeat the same problems for other vessels. Uh, the Coast Guard, we actually have... Um, a cyber command that really focuses on the internal, the Coast Guard, cyber security. But they're starting to um, broaden a little bit. They have a cyber response team that 
that can be used to investigate cyber incidents. And just recently, we had a ship that came into the Port of New York, and uh, they reported uh, some irregularities, and uh, we deployed the cyber response team to the ship. They, they welcomed them. It was a U.S. flagship, by the way. They welcomed them on board, and they did a, a kind of a forensic check on everything. All the computers, the radars, uh, they even collected all the flash drives that people were using on the ship to, to evaluate those. And they were able to determine what the problem was and share that with the company. And I think that was a win-win. If you're willing to do that, we're willing to send out these cyber response teams to you as well. Um, our Port State Control report was released online last month. Oh, he's just giving me the eyeball here. Is this is this thing flashing because I went over my time? Oh my gosh, okay. Well, I won't go into the Port State Control Report, but I, what I will say is that it is online. You can read it, I hopefully you will review it. Um, there's not, nothing really too big, too, too, too much of a change in there. We're still seeing problems with firefighting, and we're still seeing problems with the safety management system. Safety management system starts at the top, starts with the company president or the CEO, and it works its way down. If you guys don't, aren't believing in the safety management system, it will never work for you. Um, but those are, that's where we're finding the problems. So as I close up, I just wanted to say two things. One is if you're experiencing a problem before you get into port, whether it be ballast water or cyber related or equipment failure, you really need to, if, and you're coming into a US port, you really need to notify the Coast Guard, the local Coast Guard, um, of these problems because one um, we can help you avoid unnecessary delays if you let us know early enough <coughs> two it's required the, the other thing that I do want to point out is especially with ballast water a lot of the operational controls that we've imposed are immediate and uh, they can really disrupt your operations so what I would just ask that there is an appeal process, and normally the appeal process is used a lot by the Greek shipping com companies, uh, but usually it's formal and it's written, and it's done after the ship departs port. But I just want to remind you, we have a process that can um, adjudicate these appeals almost instantly. We can do them verbally, and the, we'll start out at the local captain of the port, go up to the district admiral, and end at Coast Guard headquarters. But if you request to do it verbally, we can get it done a lot quicker, within a day or two. So that would help you with your operations. With that, I'll close. I appreciate your attention, and I'm sorry I went over my time early.